More answers about the possible state of mind of the co-pilot and mental health standards for pilots that Jim was just talking about. Let's go to Anne Rosen-Spector in Miami. Uh, the doctor is a clinical psychologist. Dr. Rosen, thank you for being on the program with us. Oh, thank you. So uh, this co-pilot was deemed unfit to work. The hospital that treated him is denying it was depression. If it's not depression, what else could there be that would make you unfit to do your job? Well, there are, there are many other things. It, it could be depression and something else. He could have been comorbid, comorbid with schizophrenia, a personality disorder. It, it's very hard to know based on the evidence that we're hearing in the media. So we do know pilots typically undergo psychological testing when they are first hired but are not required mm -hmm. to undergo psych evaluations after that unless there's a specific reason. Does that need to change? Uh, you know, the, the problem is, is that all these things have to do with the jurisdiction that they're in. Uh, we don't, certainly don't have a federal rule here in the United States, uh, so it's very much up to the airlines. But the problem is there is there are a lot of things that change for people over time. So having an evaluation when the person is hired and having nothing else unless what would be the reason to have a, a subsequent one? It would probably be self-report. And you know, we, we've spoken a lot about this honest self-reporting, but the reality is if I'm a pilot and I'm having something, some emotional issue, I may not bring that up because that could mean the end of my flying career. Absolutely, and, and so what we're hearing from the reports is that there was some kind of note given to this pilot telling him not to fly or telling him that he was going to have some restriction. And the part that doesn't make sense is how was he able to rip these notes up? I mean, why weren't they given to his employer? So the, 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 the problem is the duty to warn versus the privacy of the individual. Is there a, a doctor-patient confidentiality involved here? And at, one, at, what, at what point do you have to break that rule? Again, that, that depends on, on, uh, on the jurisdiction. As far as I know, we don't have any federal rules in the United States, so it's state by state about duty to warn. So there are, in each state, fairly similar I, um, rules about when there is a potential harm to people that you are, have a duty to warn. But I have no idea what it is in Germany. And Dr. Rosen, in some cases, and I'm, again, I'm talking about a hypothetical situation here in the United States, since this is where we are, the person that seeks therapy or is speaking to a doctor, they may not really realize the exact issues they're having. So how hard is it to help them when there's no specific thing on the table. For example, this young man, obviously, I shouldn't say obviously, it seems like it wasn't really pre-planned and he just had a meltdown in that cockpit. I, I really don't know what the, what the sub, you know, whether in fact he had a meltdown or what was building over time. There, there just isn't enough evidence. But the problem is, is that in the United States, you need to have sufficient information to break confidentiality in order to notify the, the responsible parties. You, you have to be very, very sure that something is going to happen. And the problem is, if someone doesn't tell you in therapy something that is specific enough, you can be liable for malpractice if you violate the confidentiality. Wow, so many issues here. Dr. Ann Rosen-Spector, thank you so much. Thank you.